Hello Watch Enthusiasts. Now, today's topic is one which has been addressed many, many times by other YouTubers in their videos and so on. But I really wanted to produce a video that was a, a comprehensive description of the watches worn by the character James Bond throughout his, his film career. Um, because of course the watch in the, the books uh, was merely referred to as a Rolex. What we do know is that uh, Ian Fleming wore uh, an Explorer 1016. Um, but considering the things that, that uh, Bond would have to do, and being a, a naval uh, commander, actually a submariner is probably the, the obvious option as far as a watch goes. So in this video I'd like to talk about the, the history of the watches worn by Bond, um, from the very first film, uh, Doctor No, all the way through to, um, to Spectre recently. Now the first watch to be worn in one of these films was the Rolex Submariner reference 6538. And of course the reason for a, a Rolex being used was because it was stated in, uh, in the books, that Bond wore a, a Rolex uh, on his wrist. And the story behind this watch becoming a part of the props for the film, um, as a 200 meter diver, um, is, is d different depending on who you ask, really. It's a very variable story. But bearing in mind that the, the 6538, that's the, the no-date version with, uh, with the big crown and no crown guards, was discontinued in 1959, which means that by the release of this watch in 1962, it's safe to assume this watch was owned by someone on the set, and some, some believe it to be one of Sean Connery's own watches, um, while others believe that it was, it was owned by um, uh, part of the filming crew, and the reason why it was worn on a strap was because the bracelet sized for that person didn't fit Connery's wrist. Now, when released in the 1950s, this watch was the pinnacle of the Submariner lineup, um, because several models were made during the 1950s, uh, notably 100 meter divers, 150 meter versions, and this, the full 200 meters. Um, so this would have been the most professional of setups, um, and also had a slightly different uh, dial layout some of the earlier versions as well. But overall, this really does co uh, constitute what, what people see as the iconic Submariner, without its crown guards and a 38mm case, substantially smaller than today's offerings, and with a coin-edge bezel rather than that um, uh, the, the knurled bezel that one sees on the more modern versions. Now, the one interesting aspect about the fact that this watch was worn in Dr. No is the fact that it uh, it really did uh, identify the Submariner as being uh, a, an impressive timepiece for people to to aspire to own. And I say this because watches such as the the early Seamaster 300s and so on, um, and also offerings from uh, from Blancpain, offered greater water resistance than this watch, and in some ways greater legibility due to larger uh, loomed indices and so on, and also uh, just general um, uh, care taken to make the watches more durable, so such as the the crown guards seen on on early Seamasters. But uh, this really did differentiate the Submariner, and I think like the Aston Martin DB5, these really did serve to, to uh, ingratiate this to the public. Now in 1963, when From Russia With Love uh, came out in cinemas, uh, people were able to see the fact that the watch remained a, uh, a 6538 Submariner. Except this time, rather than being on a simple leather strap, it was on what appeared to be a brown crocodile leather strap that is very difficult to tell from photographs because they are few and far between um, from the filming. It was only seen in certain uh, moments in the film. And really, the first time that this Submariner gig was given a clear view was in Goldfinger, the following film. Now, in Goldfinger in 1964, which again is one of the most famous Bond films, we see probably the, the most famous wrist shot ever seen in a film. Um, and there are two shots seen in the early stages of the film before the, um, uh, the, the main meat of the drama appears, if you will. Um, and of course, it's seen on uh, worn over a dry suit uh, using uh, a 16 millimeter pass-through strap. And of course, people think it's a NATO strap, but the NATO strap was uh, produced much later and uh, even later available to the general public. And even in that era, it was only available in that that uh, gr that uh, grey, that Admiralty grey, that it was produced um, in for the Navy. Here we have a simple pass-through strap in those typical colours: the um, uh, the olive, uh, the red, and the black creating those stripes which which are have well have become extremely iconic and of course one also sees the fact that it's a far too slim strap for this watch being only 16 millimeters to the 20 millimeter lug width this watch had now one interesting thing of note with this watch is the fact that it has a, a bezel insert with even graduations in five minute intervals all around the bezel and this is very different to models of the the 6538 that you can buy these days um, in on the vintage market and the reason for that is that the vast majority of them had their inserts changed by Rolex um, when they were having their, 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 um, uh, their general services, um, as Rolex do have a notorious history of changing parts and not returning the originals. So that is one interesting thing of note, which does uh, say a lot about this watch and its originality, despite the fact that it, dis it was discontinued for six years um, by the time Goldfinger was filmed. 
Now in the 1965 film Thunderball, the same Rolex Submariner appears once more, this time still on the strap presented in the, um, in the film Goldfinger before it. However, there is one other watch which is shown, which is, is rather an interesting piece, and was incidentally bought for, for £25 at a flea market a few years ago, and ended up being sold for, um, for 100000 But this is a Breitling Top Time, which um, has been placed into a Tourneau-style case, with little regard to, um, uh, to the actual functionality of it, as it's presented by Q as a, uh, a Geiger counter, um, which is used later on in the film. So it's effectively a watch which was, I think, made specifically for the film, but wasn't terribly functional, in that there isn't uh, any more uh, um, uh, arrangement which allows the pushes to be used, in there are no holes for the pushes to be, to be put into this new case. So it really is the movement and dial which have been put into a, um, a new case to be presented in the film. But certainly it made for a rather interesting um, uh, piece in the film, and it is interesting how it was um, uh, bought, being assumed um, to, to be a simple um, fake or... Um, or simply a watch that, um, a Franken watch as one might call it, a watch made up of different parts from other brands, um, and turned out to be such a, a noteworthy timepiece. Now the watch worn in the 1967 film You Only Live Twice is much more vague, it's very difficult to tell what the watch is, because one only sees it very briefly um, when Bond is playing cards from the edge of his cuff. And the general consensus is that he was wearing his own little golden Gruen um, with a, a small seconds um, crosshair subdial, um, and, uh, and, and a white um, a style of sunburst dial. Um, so certainly that is the most likely watch to have been worn. It was uh, one of Sean Connery's own, um, rather than being one given to him for the film. Um, because, of course, most of the film, uh, there wouldn't be the, the, the space, really, or at least the time for a watch to be sort of shown in detail, um, as was the case in previous films. Now, in 1969, the film On Her Majesty's Secret Service was released with uh, George Lazenby rather than uh, Sean Connery as, as the title character. And I personally think this was a very good film in terms of the Bond franchise. It, uh, it, it explained quite a few things that weren't previously explained, um, and, uh, and certainly, uh, I think, added some depth to the character. But in terms of the watches worn, there were two, and the first being a, a Rolex 5513, a 200-metre Submariner, with the same water resistance as the previous versions used, but with, uh, with the appearance of a far more modern watch, notably the fact that it now has crown guards, um, and has a slightly beefed up case at 40mm rather than being 38. Similarly, the bezel um, insert has been adjusted to have graduations to 15, um, and, uh, and also it has uh, better knurlings on the edge of the bezel to further increase its usability as a dive watch. Um, and of course the watch does appear to be far more modern than previous watches seen, um, due to the fact that it's just a, a more sorted dive watch, and also um, there are still uh, aspects which do date it to that era, uh, for instance, the, the triangle at 12 o'clock, which is elongated by comparison to modern versions, but I personally find rather charming. The other watch seen is a Rolex 6238, and for those who are interested in their, their pre-Daytona chronographs, this is one of the, the most well-known and important. Um, notably, it, it does still have a tachymeter, um, and, and all the features that you would expect to see on a Daytona, apart from the fact that it doesn't have that external bezel, but rather has the tachymeter on the in, in, inside of the dial and has an all-around much more traditional aesthetic to the case, with much more rounded edges, and, and I think a, a softer look, which I personally think looks absolutely splendid on these watches. Um, and I think actually, as far as vintage uh, chronographs from Rolex go, um, these are, in my opinion, much, much better value than Daytona's, um, in that Daytona's, um, in terms of rarity, um, models which are similar in rarity, fetch uh, hundreds of thousands of pounds, while these though it's still an enormous sum of money, £20,000 is made to seem quite good value by comparison. Now for the 1971 film Diamonds Are Forever, uh, it's thought that uh, Sean Connery, who was retaken for the role, um, wore his gold Gruen, um, because no other watch has been seen um, in terms of photographs of him on set and so on. So it is very much assumed that this is the watch worn. Um, so again, this, this has become really the watch that's been worn um, as a sort of uh, a, a backup watch when not offered a watch by anyone else, um, and this was clearly simply his personal watch that he would wear on, fit on set and for filming, regardless of, uh, of the, the role. Along with the new Bond, Roger Moore, in, uh, in Live and Let Die from 1973, we see a new watch and the advent of the digital timepiece. Because the first watch we see in the film is a, a brushed bracelet a Hamilton Pulsar digital watch. Um, these early watches were, were, were hardly perfected, um, and had, uh, were known for very uh, short battery lives and so on. Um, but this does show uh, the, 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 the rise of these digital timepieces throughout the 1970s and 1980s in the form of Bond wristwatches. 
Now, the first feature of this watch that the, uh, the viewers are shown is its, its sheer magnetism, as will be put by, by Roger Moore. Um, and that's the fact that uh, one can uh, adjust the crown, which causes the, 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 the indices on the dial to, to change to red. Um, which causes the watch to become very magnetic and uh, and as a result is used to um, catch a spoon, uh, deflect a bullet and indeed undo a dress. Now the other watch in this film, which is indeed meant to represent the same watch, but this is a, is a mock-up with a, a, a false crystal dial and bezel, which with the, the help of those serrations along the edge of the bezel, is able to cut through um, uh, hand restraints in the case of the film. Um, and this watch sold in 2015 uh, due to its its uh, incredible fame gained from being in the film. Um, and, uh, and of course, since the film has been watched over a billion times, the, the final price was rather high, though I, I, I can't find the exact figure to tell you. And the other watch actually did work um, as a, a saw, though of course the, the watch functions uh, didn't exist. It does have a motor inside it that would spin the bezel, uh, dial and crystal assembly to cut through things. Now in the next film, uh, The Spy Who Loved Me, uh, various uh, watches were seen, and uh, the, the two most prominent were the Rolex GMT Master with a Pepsi bezel. That, that only made a, a brief appearance. The watch that was worn for most of the film was a Seiko 0674 LC, um, with, uh, with the calendar, um, which uh, was uh, another advance in Quartz watches, in Quartz digital watches, and really did, uh, did prove to, to be the watches worn primarily by uh, Roger Moore throughout his tenure. Um, and of course this watch also had the added functionality of being sort of a printer as it would print out uh, paper messages from, uh, from M um, throughout the film to, uh, to, to give uh, Bond uh, tip-offs about various, uh, various things. So it, it's an interesting piece though, it certainly shows a deviation from the previous uh, analogue watches that, are, are, that were seen pr uh, prior to this and indeed later on. The next watch to look at is featured in the 1979 release of Moonraker which I must say I think is the, probably the worst Bond film of them all. But uh, regardless, this is the M354 um, from Seiko, and of course this is a, a further evolution in their world of digital watches, um, and did mark a, a change as, uh, as watches became more and more uh, multifunctional. Um, though I must say, I, I, I do feel these watches never have the aesthetics of a traditional analogue watch. Now that said, I do feel this watch is still a, a watch which is certainly in keeping with the film's um, theme of, of space and so on. And of course it does have an exploding function which is, is put to good use by Bond later on in the film. Now the 1981 release, For Your Eyes Only, features two watches. Um, and the first of which seen for most of the scenes of the film is this, uh, this version, which is an H357 from Seiko. And it's a further continuation along their digital line of watches, in this case in this analogue digital format, with the bottom half of the dial being an analogue clock um, with alarm, and then the top, uh, top half, um, or at least top section, being a digital screen for other functions, so to, such as the chronograph uh, and the, the alarm, uh, to be set and, uh, and regulated. So this is quite an interesting watch and does show the value of uh, uh, an analogue watch in that people clearly were still interested in them during this era. But the second watch I feel shown in the, the diving scenes of this film is my personal favourite from this film. Now the second watch is only seen briefly during some of the underwater scenes, and this is a Seiko 7549-7009. And those who know their Seikos will note this is the 600 meter uh, quartz tuner, which is a, a favourite um, of mine in terms of uh, dive watches, in terms of the, di the history of dive watches, due to the technology involved in this watch to create a 600 meter diver with an extremely scratch resistant titanium coated case, hence it's known as the golden tuner, um, and also features a high torque quartz movement with an end of life indicator, because Seiko found that their, their mechanical movements weren't accurate enough for the, the, um, uh, the strict uh, timings needed for diving. While talking about the tuner, I will also put a link to my, um, uh, my video on the tuner's history for you to have a look if you're, you're interested in learning about this curious diver. Throughout the vast majority of the next film, Octopussy, we see Bond wearing the, the Seiko Sports 100, which is again a further evolution of their, their digital watches, um, this time in a more rugged case with a, a PVD bezel, um, if one can call that a bezel, and indeed uh, what is used in the film as a, a tracking device um, on the uh, left uh, top edge of the, the dial. Now one other watch which is uh, rather shamelessly demonstrated in this um, with regards to, uh, to advertising by Seiko is their TV watch which is uh, tampered with by Bond to show a certain part of, of Q's assistant um, much to I think the amusement of the audience but certainly product placement here Seiko have been able to make a watch which has been remembered by film audiences very well. Several watches are seen in the next film, A View to a Kill from 1985 
Um, and the, 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 the watch which is, I suppose, most illustrious in terms of the models used is indeed the Rolex uh, Datejust worn by, um, uh, by Roger Moore. But in terms of other watches, there are two Seikos which, uh, which also share the role, which are rather interesting. Now the first is a 150 meter diver with this analog digital arrangement and that uh, loomed central dial with a depth gauge around the edge, um, and indeed the chronograph function. And this watch is known as being more of a watch um, uh, seen on Arnold Schwarzenegger and known for that specifically, but this watch was also worn in that film um, as one of the more robust timepieces worn by Bond. The next watch um, seen here is indeed the Seiko 7A28-7020, and this is a quartz white dial chronograph which happens to have three pushers um, and a crown um, displaced to the four, uh, four o'clock position, meaning you have two on either side of the watch. And this is a watch which has a, a striking resemblance to the, uh, the Omega Speedmaster in terms of its dial layout, but certainly was a nice return to the fully analogue aspect of a, a wristwatch. Um, and indeed this was the, the, uh, the, well, well, one of the last films to feature any sort of digital watch in the Bond franchise. Um, and uh, these watches are certainly very, very collectible these days, um, fetching up to about £500 for an absolutely mint model. Um, and uh, I know that one of my friends happens to, uh, to, to own one, um, and uh, certainly having had a look at it, they are, they are very interesting pieces. Quite small chronographs, and of course they are quartz of their era, um, but certainly they're, they're very interesting pieces. Of course, one is also ignoring the fact that these watches uh, were the first analogue quartz chronographs which adds uh, an, an immense amount of history to these watches as far as being a real innovation. And which does seem, I suppose, ironic, because um, Seiko were producing digital uh, watches at that era, which were believed to be better and superior to uh, analogue watches. Um, and yet it took longer to innovate a quartz uh, chronograph with an analogue dial than a digital one. Now, in his first film as Bond, uh, Timothy Dalton in The Living Daylights wears a Tag Heuer 1000, a professional night dive. And that's to say the full PVD uh, white uh, luminescent dial version of the Tag Heuer 1000. And often it's the, this watch is mistaken for its, uh, it, its cousins with the beefier cases um, and the automatic movements, uh, still with that, uh, that white dial, but with a non-PVD case. But from the photographs from the film, it seems pretty clear that it was the PVD version that in fact he wore uh, in the smaller sizes than those larger versions with the, the PVD-less case. Now I certainly do think this watch is fitting for the new uh, new bond invented by Timothy Dalton, considering the fact that this uh, that this bond was altogether more more vigorous and violent than the somewhat geriatric performance of um, of Roger Moore in his his later years as Bond. So certainly this watch, with its uh, its dark and and stealth uh, stealthy case and and bezel with its PVD finish, and then that bright fully loomed dial certainly went along with the more tactical theme taken by this new bond. Now, in Timothy Dalton's second film, Licence to Kill, he is in fact the last Bond to wear a Rolex Submariner, um, and indeed wears the then brand new 16610 Submariner with the 300 meter water resistance, in this case the date and that Cyclops, as well as also having the, um, uh, the, the, the renewed bezel with a slightly finer text, and also a, a new luminescence on it. Of course, these watches were pre-Maxidal uh, versions, so they still had the smaller, new, uh, smaller um, uh, indices, rather. And also one doesn't have the, the, the more sharply pointed triangle at 12 o'clock as seen on older models, but rather a more conservatively shaped model, released that year in 1989. Now the 1995 film Goldeneye featured Pierce Brosnan for the first time, and also with him came the new Omega Seamaster 300M in blue. And in this case we have the, the quartz version, reference uh, 2541.80. And this is a version of the watch which has, I think, by now become a real design classic, um, it's still in production, admittedly having changed somewhat over the years. Um, and of course the, uh, the quartz version has been discontinued along with some red text on the dial and a ceramic bezel, and also new crowns. But the general de design aesthetic of this watch has remained the same, and I think has, has proven really what, a, what an iconic watch this has become. And of course it's, it's a, a dive watch with a helium escape valve scallop bezel and, uh, and indeed a quartz movement in this case but uh, certainly it presented a new brand showing their product throughout these, uh, the, these Bond films, along with a new, uh, a new face to match with a watch. Now the only real change made to these watches for the next film, Tomorrow Never Dies, uh, was the fact that it was now the reference uh, 2531.80, uh, which means that this is the automatic version with that chronometer certification, um, which is slightly different in terms of dial layout, notably the date window is, is shifted slightly due to the movement change, but otherwise this is very much the same watch. Um, but uh, also does have that, um, that characteristic, slightly too short minute hand, that is correct in later models. Now for 1999's movie, The World Is Not Enough, 
Uh, the same uh, Omega Seamaster 300M is used with the automatic movement and same dial and sizing as well, except that now it features a grappling hook on its side which is used to uh, save Bond from an avalanche um, during the film and uh, as a result has gained a certain degree of uh, popularity due to this. Though I must say, as far as um, uh, the, the gadgets on these watches go, this is one of the more far-fetched ones, and I think has led to the fact that these films are seen as very, very cheesy, I think, by a great deal of viewers, um, as trying to recreate the humorous days of, of Roger Moore, but without really any of the charm and the, the sort of um, contextual details that I think helped those films. Now, the same Omega Seamaster 300 appears again in Die Another Day, um, as this was just before Omega released their, their newer, updated coaxial version of this watch. Um, and this watch featured again the same gadgetry as seen in the previous film, notably a laser that came out of the crown and similarly a, uh, um, a bomb placed in the, the helium escape valve. Now rebooting the series in 2006 with Casino Royale, uh, Daniel Craig was uh, furnished by Omega with two watches for the filming of this, um, the, the, this film. And in the first um, section of the film, the title sequences, he's wearing a, uh, an Omega Seamaster Planet Ocean, that's the, the first produced with the black bezel and black dial, um, and the thinner case than previously seen with their coaxial movement, um, though without the exhibition case back as seen on more, more recent uh, iterations of this watch. But this was uh, quite a groundbreaking watch for Omega, and they certainly wanted to demonstrate it in the, the best light, um, so as a result in the most um, vigorous of the action scenes in this film, this watch is worn. Um, which does make sense with its 600 meters water resistance and uh, additional uh, rigidity and uh, um, strength compared to previous 300Ms. Of course, Omega also make full use of the fact that this watch is a 45.5 mm watch to make it altogether more and more um, uh, visible throughout the uh, the action sequences. But certainly, I don't think they were too um, uh, too obtrusive with their their product placement. Um, and certainly, I think most people watching the film rather liked the Planet Ocean, even though it had only just been released. Throughout the rest of the film, though, we see an updated version of the 300M, again with that blue dial and bezel, but now with some red text on it, lengthened hands to make them look um, uh, look more legible and also reach the markers better, and also with the new coaxial movement, which at this time was based on earlier movements just with a coaxial escapement, rather than their more modern movements these days, which are entirely in-house. But nonetheless, this was a very groundba uh, groundbreaking watch and a real development for the 300M, so certainly Omega were keen to present it in this light. Now the watch warning in Quantum of Solace um, is indeed the Omega Planet Ocean 2201.50 and this is the version on the bracelet with that, uh, that aluminium insert on the bezel and the closed case back. So this version was very very similar to the 2006 version seen previously um, but just showed that the Bond franchise was uh, moving away from the blue uh, the blue Seamasters towards the Planet Ocean lines, a more rugged and resilient version of that original Seamaster. And bearing in mind that in terms of case uh, profile and, uh, and design and also the dial design, this watch is modelled after the original military um, Omega Seamaster 300s uh, from the 1960s. This does show that they are trying to return to their past in a sort of a, a modern fashion with this 600 meter diver. Now in Skyfall, two new watches are seen from Omega, and the one that most people uh, don't notice is the Seamaster Aquaterra worn in a lot of the, uh, the suited scenes, um, where Bond wears a uh, more formal attire. And this is the version with the straight dial, with that sunburst effect, that sunburst blue effect, which I think is a really fantastic look. But of course this is a 150 meter coaxial um, in-house chronometer, and of course this was the, the year when there were the first of the, um, the fully in-house Omega movements that were decorated in the way we've come to expect from Omega, and um, with those exhibition case backs. So th th this really was a way of showcasing their new watches by presenting various options, um, and notably this, um, uh, this rather attractive version of the Seamaster. Now the Planet Ocean scene in the various action sequences of this film is on the face of things very similar to a, a production version and it has the, the new ceramic um, bezel as well as the fact that it has the, the bicolor loom on the, uh, the minute hand and the, the loom pip which allows you to differentiate the, the blue and the green of the hands in the dark and allow you to read the time more quickly. But uh, in truth, um, apart from the 8500 uh, caliber movement inside this, the rest of the case is very different in that it's, it has a full titanium case and bracelet. Um, which was made spe specifically for this film to be worn. And of course, Omega have released titanium versions of Planet Ocean since, but this was before those were released, and so as a result, it makes this watch altogether more noteworthy. And of course, the reason why um, this watch uh, was made like this was, uh, was to really showcase the new technology. And as well as that, uh, this watch was in the end sold for just shy of 200,000 euros in 2012, as one of the first titanium Seamasters um, in this, um, this particular um, form of... Um, of publicity being worn by James Bond as well. 
Now, the final watch seen in a Bond film is, of course, the, uh, the Omega Seamaster 300, made specifically for Spectre. And this watch, I think, is a remarkable success, considering most people agree that the film was pretty underwhelming, frankly. So, uh, as a result, uh, this watch really has, I think, taken the market very, very well in a world of, um, of, of heritage-style watches, um, from the Tudor Black Bay, for instance. This watch offers something that's far, far more luxurious, um, in, of course, limited edition format. But the changes to this watch over the standard version of this watch are, of course, the, the lollipop second hand um, and that, um, that liquid metal ceramic uh, bezel insert, and also the bi-directional bezel rather than being unidirectional uh, diving bezel is instead now a sort of a, a GMT style of bezel, despite the fact that it is only a three-hand watch. But certainly I think this watch has uh, presented itself as a very good um, watch that's been designed specifically for the, the Bond franchise, which is a rarity, really. Um, usually um, these watches are, are simply production models that, uh, that companies have paid to have placed in the film, but here one really has a watch that has been made for the film. Of course this watch is fairly suited to the Bond style of, uh, of existence, I suppose, because it is very resilient to the elements, being water resistant to 300 metres, and also anti-magnetic to 15,000 gauss, a pretty unprecedented number really in the world of watchmaking. But uh, of course this is also suited to travel as well, as shown in the film. And of course, as uh, stated in the various uh, promotional features produced, um, and also in the film, of course, it does have rather a loud alarm as it explodes um, during the film. So certainly, I think they've they've taken a, a swing back towards the, the gadgetry of previous films. Um, but certainly, I think they've done a very very good job with this final watch. Anyway, after this uh, very long video, I, I will conclude the video here. But uh, thank you very much for watching, and do please like, share, and subscribe if you did enjoy the video and would like to see more content on the channel. Um, and enjoy more videos. So thank you very much for watching. This is Arm on the Watch Guy, over and out.